everyone to Common Sense Choices, and I'm Linda Tupin. You guys, today's a very special day. It has been two months that you and I have been on this journey together. OMG, and I've got some big numbers to give you, and I can't wait to share them with you. You guys, we started out by talking about choices. And as you look in the background at my seven foot piece of art in the back, you'll see my mantra and it's on my coffee cup this morning. And we're going to say it together. This makes, I think the 12th time we've all said it together because it's our eighth episode. And then we have had four mailbox ish. Uh, I keep calling these things issues, like I'm running a newspaper or something. They're called episodes. But anyway, we all know the mantra now, but we're all going to say it together because we want to affirm this over and over and ever again. And that is, I am where I am by the choices I have made or I have allowed others to make for me. It's all about personal responsibility. We're on this great journey of personal responsibility and living life out loud. We talked about how the fact that God had given you 168 hours this week, that's 10,800 minutes to use any way that you wanted. And what you do with those minutes, with those hours is what you get at the end of your life. And you know, you're also making 35,000 choices. That's correct. You made 35,000 choices today and you clicked play. And that was one of those choices. And that little accumulation of choices makes a big difference in the end result. And so let's talk a little bit about our winners in the way this game works, you guys, and many of you are familiar with it. Every time you comment, every time you share, every time you like, your name goes into a drawing and one of our friends and followers and listeners will have an opportunity to go over to my website, lindatupin.com. That's T as in Tom, O-U, P as in Peter, I-N, lindatupin.com, and click the little link that says stuff I didn't know I needed. <laughs> All right, that's my little store. My mantra is on a number of items over there, including my coffee cup. And so we're going to give a gift from over there to our winner from last week's episode with my friend Pam Shaw. And drum roll, please. Our winner is Katie Ray Ventagren. <laughs> Congratulations, Katie Ray. We've got a great gift coming your way. Now, you guys, to make sure that you never miss any of those episodes, I don't know about y'all, but I am so tired of trying to remember things. Maybe I'm running out of brain cells. I'm not for sure what it is. But instead of trying to remember that these episodes are released every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube, uh, streaming live into my Facebook group, why don't you just let us email them to you? All right. And in order to get them emailed to you, you just go over to lindatupin.com again and click sign up. Just click the sign up button. Give me your text information. Give me your email information. And then that way you don't have to think about it. That's, you won't have to think about it. Now, remember, it's a little two-step system. So as soon as you click OK, we're sending you an email that you have to verify. It's part of the security system. You know, you know the rules of the game these days. And so we want to make sure uh, that you are connected because, guys, we're on this journey together. And it has been so fun. So our first four episodes in December all dealt with mental health. As you well know, there was a whole lot that we could talk about. We could talk about mental health probably for the rest of our lives. But there were four episodes on mental health, including one with psychotherapist Pat Pearson. And by the way, you guys, I have my notebook. Do you guys have your notebook? You're taking notes during these episodes. This is an accumulation of an amazing life experiences that I'm giving you. And all the secrets of, I think, what a happy life, a successful life, a successful business, a successful family, I'm giving it to you. So it's in the notebook. Make sure you're taking good notes during all of this. In January, we moved over to physical health and we've had some amazing speakers. Would you not agree? Dr. Lena Edwards, my yoga instructor, who's a world champion, and Pam Shaw, my friend. OMG, guys, this was so big in February. There was so much good information and your comments definitely affirmed us on that. And I do have a little bit of announcement. This is like a little teaser. I think I might have my very first sponsor for my podcast. You know, I've been telling you, this is my hobby and hobbies cost money <laughs> and businesses make money. But I think I may have a very first sponsor because I thought I just want somebody to sponsor my show that like I 100% believe in. So I'm just going to tell you, you'll be hearing a little bit more about that later. But all right, so here's my big announcement. This is 
literally I'm filming this on the second month anniversary of our first episode. So I ran some quick numbers last night on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube with everything we've put out there from the teasers to the episodes to the mailboxes. And it looks like our numbers of views have increased to <laughs> another drum roll. I'm so excited. 51,289. Now I know that's not millions and I know I'm not Joe Rogan, but I'm so excited because you know what? Jesus started with 12 people. Look what he did. So I know that we can do big things together and we can make a positive difference in this world, you guys. And it starts with just you and I. Well, we're ready to transition today and I can hardly wait for you to meet my guest speaker. So we're going to transition for the next two months into the topic of what does it really take to run a business from your home? What does it really take you guys to run a business from your home? Now, you may be thinking, I want to run my business from my home. I'm a daycare provider or I'm a seamstress or I'm a, a mechanic. I'm working out of my garage. Uh, all, of the, all of those people, including a lot of people in direct sales, are running businesses from their home. Now, the reason this is a big deal right now is because during the age of COVID, during the great resignation where people had to come home to work and now they're kind of staying home. I don't know if you've noticed, but they're kind of staying home. They are wanting to call their own shots. And so whatever platform you choose to call your own shots, you're still going to be running a business from your home. And there is a lot to unpack with that. And that's why it's going to take me two months and a lot of guest speakers to set that up and really dig down deep. So be sure to share these episodes, guys, with husbands, spouses, everybody that you're in association with, because there's literally tens of millions of people around the world that want to know how to run a successful business from your home. So I chose as my guest speaker for the very first episode, somebody uh, that as soon as I read her accolades, you will clearly understand that she knows how to run a successful business from your home. However, you're going to be surprised at the first topic. It's not money management, time management, setting healthy boundaries. It's none of those things. It's whether you view yourself as a victim or a victor. Because I can't imagine calling your own shots, being in charge of your life, embracing the mantra, I am where I am by the choices I've made or allowed others to make for me. If you view yourself as a victim and she clearly will get this message across to you in a way that will inspire you off the charts. And so let me give you her professional accolades before you meet her. My good friend and longtime professional coworker in the world is Miss Cindy Williams. Cindy decided 40 years ago to start her own in-home business, and that decision completely changed her life. And a lot of you out there in the great resignation are about to find out that your life is very different when you call your own shots. All right. She, uh, over the, she went on over the next four decades, 40 years, to actually become one of the top leaders of both nationally and international organizations until her retirement just a couple of months ago. Cindy has spent her adult life teaching, leading, inspiring tens of thousands of women all over the world, all over the globe. Her career put her on stage in front of thousands of people in Spain, Mexico, Australia, Germany, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, Singapore, and Switzerland. And of course, all over the good old USA. But you know what? It didn't start there. Cindy has always had a passion for working with women in crisis, and she's volunteered many hours of her life in women's shelters, now known as crisis intervention centers. You see, Cindy could have chosen a different path, that of victim. Instead, she chose the path of victor. Can we have a huge round of applause and please welcome on the screen, my good friend, Cindy. Yay! Thank you, Linda Tupin. 
<laughs> well, Cindy, I mailed you a coffee cup and because of the ice storm, we're filming early. It didn't come. It was supposed to look like this. And because Cindy is the most ingenious person I know, <laughs> you're going with a marker. <laughs> <laughs> so, Cindy, welcome to our podcast. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you for taking your time with me and the thousands and ten thousands, uh, hopefully hundreds of thousands of people that eventually uh, view this. So, I read your professional accolades, but I want to tell people a couple of little stories about you before I ask you some questions this morning. You know, uh, I, I started thinking back over the I guess it's been about three decades, three and a half decades that we've like known each other well, more so in the past three decades. But I've always heard you quote Romans 12, six through eight. And it was all about how we each have our own gifts. And, you know, there was something about that scripture that just put everybody's soul at ease. Because once my audience meets you, they're going to think I could never be Cindy. She's so positive and she's so happy and, and she's so energy giving and maybe I'm wired differently. And it's real easy to compare yourself. People can look at me and say, she's a strategist and, you know, her brain works this X, Y, Z way. And, you know, we'd have been great married to each other, Cindy. <laughs> we would have. I mean, we're really kind of opposite personalities in, in some ways, but I always was so field when you would would quote that and you know uh my audience hasn't met you yet a few in the audience already know you and know your gifts but i looked up the latin for the word enthusiasm and it means god within and i can't think of a better word that describes my friend cindy williams than god within you are a bright shiny light to this dark world and everywhere you go, literally, is, is you're just touching people and bringing light into their life. And so, you know, I'm going to show on the screen right now your life as it's shown by social media. And by many of us who know you, you're going to see you and the new love of your life one year newly married. <laughs> uh, you and Dean with your vintage Airstream, your boats. <laughs> Every single day, I think you're buying a new hot rod, some vintage yes, hot rod are. and trading. You're a wheeler and a dealer and that kind of stuff. And I just laughed out loud the other day when after you had retired and what did you do? You, you and Dean went hunting <laughs> and you're just on the road of life, living it out loud. And so if anybody, and I'm sure people will watch this and they'll pull you up on social media and they think, wow, her life has always been like that. She's a victor man. She is, you know, she's got her act together and life was never hard for her. And today we're going to learn that you had a choice. And just like every one of my viewers who are watching this right now, you have a choice every single day to play victim or to choose Victor. So Cindy Williams, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> Has it always been all these glorious pictures I just showed everybody? <laughs> no, you know, and I say, like the scripture, um, I think that DNA stands for do not argue with your creator. He all made us unique in all the world. We all have different gifts according to the grace given to us. And I'm just a self-proclaimed joyologist. <laughs> Similar to your mantra, you know, it's not what happens, it's how you deal with it. You can be a victim or a victor, and we choose victory. And um, I think that joy, um, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Happiness can come and go. You know, there are happy people in huts and miserable people in mansions. <laughs> so you got to choose your happy. But I talk, depends on the audience, if you want to give hope and encouragement, whether it's business or life. But I say I had a colorful childhood because I choose to be better, not bitter. I choose to be fascinated by life, not frustrated. Um, but as a child, it was a lot of chaos. I never went to the same school twice um, in one year in my life. I changed schools every single year until the eighth grade. So I did go to the seventh grade and I in the eighth grade. And then from then on, even through graduation. And it wasn't because my dad was military. My mom and dad divorced when I was six. My sisters were four and two. And then it's because my mom made bad choices with men. She was a great mom. I, I adore her, adored her, 
but her choices in men were bad. There was always alcoholism. There was always abuse and tremendous chaos. Um, but somehow by God's grace and my grit, I just was determined. I was the oldest of the three girls and I was determined to make my mom happy, to give her some joy. So I made really good grades. Um, my IQ may not be the highest, but I am the most disciplined person I know. And I studied hard and she got victory in that. And then when I was 16, my mom had uh, her second nervous breakdown, but this one, she went away to a mental hospital for a year and I had to figure out what to do. And I wanted to finish high school. So when she got out, she would have that victory and not be worried that what happened to her affected me negatively. So I got my own place. I worked two jobs and um, I didn't have $40 to put uh, propane in my tank for heat. It was in Louisiana. It wasn't Kentucky. It probably wasn't as cold, but still cold, humid weather. It was cold. When I breathe at night, I could see the white, you know, frosty air, but I had an electric blanket and there was a heater in the car so I could get up early, get in my car and uh, get to school. I did graduate from high school. Very proud of that. I didn't go to college, but I'm super proud of my high school education. It's all relative to your perspective of where you come from. And so when my mom got out, I had that victory, but I worked those two jobs and um, I just never complained. I was always in a spirit of gratitude somehow. God's grace gave me that. And I looked at what I had right in my life and not what I had wrong. And those things served me well as an entrepreneur. I learned to compartmentalize as a child. I had to. I could block out the noise. If you're older, you'll remember used to be Disney would come on on Sunday nights and Tinkerbell would fly onto the screen and she'd touch the, touch the screen three times and the colors would block out everything behind it. And I learned to do that as a child. I could just touch my head and I would block out the chaos and the noise. And somehow, you know, Jesus protected me from being really crazy girl. <laughs> I'm crazy, but I'm crazy good today. So I share that sometimes to give people hope that you can be victim or victor and you can take your past and let it mold you as a stepping stone instead of a stumbling block. Well, and you have done that so beautifully. You know, you were talking there a second ago that, you know, you may not be the, the smartest person out there in the world, but you're the most disciplined person and you made up for that. And I think that's where each of our gifts come into play is where an area that you may be. You know, I, I attended a two room school uh, wow. for my first through fifth grade, there was five kids in my class. I could give you a list a mile long of all the benefits of a two room school. But, you know, if you watch this podcast, I put prepositions at the end of sentences. Like I stumble over words I can't pronounce because we weren't taught phonics. Um, I mean, it goes on and on it, and, and true. My son is like wicked, smart, wicked, smart doctor, top in his field. And he went away to some prestigious school and came home the first time. He goes, Mom, you taught us to say these words really wrong. <laughs> and I was like, it don't matter. It don't matter if that <laughs> it's irrelevant. <laughs> That's just show. <laughs> my heart's right and I'm determined I'm going to get it done and that's what you did and and so let's talk about let's talk about before we move on with your story because there's so much in your story that is an inspiration there are people already crying in this story there's already people listening driving down the road by the way you guys if you're watching on Apple Apple or Spotify hands on the wheel nine and two enjoy the journey but don't cry too hard because this is touching people because they didn't compartmentalize I want to talk about that. I, I love that analogy of like, I could just touch the screen and I could block out the background. So what did that look like as a child? And then how did that kind of, how did you do that as, as you moved on? You know, um, you don't remember a lot of the bad. Uh, I really just remember how much my mom loved us. She loved her three girls. She thought we were the best thing that ever happened to her, but somehow, she just didn't think she could do it by herself. So she had, you know, bad taste in men. And my mom and dad owned a bar before they got a divorce. That's not the great thing for a marriage or maybe it wasn't for them. And, but that's the only thing she knew was waiting tables, bartending. And so she would go back into that world and then meet another person that wasn't a healthy relationship. And so, but my seventh and eighth grade, a person that was so impactful in my life and all of you that are teachers or have had great teachers in your life, 
then they can make such a difference. A great coach, a great teacher can change a kid and a bad one can change a kid. But in the seventh grade, I was this tall, lanky kid. I went to a school of 11 people in my seventh grade class, nine girls and two boys. <laughs> and when Coach Poole saw me walk in the door, because we changed schools all the time, oh my goodness, he said, you're a basketball player. And I said, oh no, sir, I'm not. But he needed a player. <laughs> And I didn't have a lot of choices. And so he grabbed me, put me on that basketball court, and he threw me a ball and said, shoot. Well, I couldn't get it even halfway to the basket from the free throw line. But he gave me a big white heavy ball, a medicine ball, threw it back and forth. And, and then I shot. And when that light ball, I got made it all the way to the, to the goal. So he started working with me. And this is, was a turning point in my life, Linda. Someone that believed in me, and I wanted to prove him right. I wanted to make my mom proud. I wanted to make my coach proud. And I have never met a good man ever. So he, he was like my hero. So I would get to school early and run laps before he had us run them. I was that girl that did and then some as a kid. Where did that come from? God's grace, my grit, I don't know. But I wanted to prove him right. And I became a really good basketball player in the seventh grade. He put me underneath the goal and I knew how to defend my mama. So I could defend that post and nobody scored on me. And then when it was time to move again, my mom said, let's go. That movie Chocolat, the wind would blow and here we'd go again. I'd say, mom, please let me stay here and live with my grandparents and go to the eighth grade so I can play for Coach Poole. And she let me. And so the eighth grade was the happiest year of my life. And um, we never lost a game. Linda, a little bitty school, nobody ever heard of, Nebo, Louisiana. But to me, it was like being in the final four. <laughs> <laughs> it was like going to the Olympics. I loved my coach. And I give a lot of credit to him in my life in that little window. Then the ninth grade, we moved. The 10th grade, we moved. The 11th grade, we moved. By the time I was a senior, I had to get my own house. My mom went away for a year. And I got my own house and um, didn't have heat. And But I just finished. And so, you know, looking back, do you get bitter or better? Really, and you know, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and called according to his purpose. I do love the Lord and I attribute a lot of that. I never went to church. Nobody in my family went to church, but my grandmother would read the Bible to me. She didn't go to church, she couldn't drive, but she would. She planted the seed. And I just think somehow I was protected. And, uh, but you know, I did marry at 18, the wrong person that was very physically abusive because that's all I knew and my self-esteem was so very low. He went to prison. I don't even usually ever tell that whole story because he robbed a store. It was crazy. He never had a job. I had three. <laughs> and then, um, then um, I went to work again. You know, I just was surviving, not really thriving in those early years, but, but happy because the joy is internal. You know, you can choose your happy. You can choose your joy. And that spirit of gratitude will give you more energy than anything else in the whole wide world. So today, if you're in the middle, you know, there's either, you're either in the middle of a crisis, you got, got through a crisis, or you're fixing to have one. Life isn't fair, but it's really not how you, what happens, it's how you deal with it. And if you just start thinking of all the things you're grateful for and what you could do instead of what you couldn't do, that all of a sudden you're reborn. It's like this energy will come and this creativeness will come. And then uh, I did remarry. I had my first son. I worked as a secretary until the day before I had him. Um, and I don't know, I could go into this. I got a job just to answer the telephone at that little office place. I'd never had a job where I got paid to sit down. The only jobs I ever had, I had to stand up, wait tables, tin bar, work as a checker. And I got to sit down all day. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna keep this job. And I was just hired to fill in for a girl that had surgery, but she never got her job back. Cause again, I got there early, I stayed late. I learned to use the 10 key on my own. I took that calculator at home every night and I did payroll for 300 plumbers and pipe fitters at Fort Polk, Louisiana. And I worked there um, for, I think for four years until I married and had my son. And then I didn't want to go back to work and leave my baby. And so I stayed home. Nurse Tim was a complete a fanatic about my son. I was organic before anybody talked about it. I would ground the little carrots and put them in ice cube trays and only feed him food and nursed him, you know, as long as I could. And then he quit nursing and I got restless and um, it was never a healthy marriage. I won't go into that, but I was married 34 years in a very unhealthy situation because I, I didn't choose well. 
And so um, I was very restless. And that's when I started my own home-based business, just so I could be a work from home mama. 40 years ago, I was 25 and today I'm 65. I mean, seriously, like I could go home now. I mean, seriously, Cindy, just, just this, these few small minutes in, in the first part of this, it gives anybody hope that they can take where they are right now, look inside themselves, the spirit of gratitude. Cause I've been thinking like, what kind of homework when we get done? Cause I give people homework after this is over is it's all about looking at what your gifts are. What is, what are you grateful for? And we have so much to be grateful for in this country. Amen. And it, 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 it sends me off the rail when I see people who, who down our country and, and take all of this for granted. And I, I want to scream at them and say, go live somewhere else in another country and, and come back. But that's a whole nother topic for another day. But, you know, it is that choice, uh, choice to be joyful. So in the beginning, I mean, all of this is coming, honestly, the only place it could have come from is the Lord, because there was, I mean, other than your grandma and, and the fact that you recognize that your mom loved you uh, and that you just fought to survive. But, you know, over time, we become like the people we're around. So clearly you were around, you know, some people that were making unwise choices. But as your in-home business grew, so let's move into in-home business. Your in-home business began to put you in contact with a lot of big thinkers. So what began to change with an in-home business? Uh, you know, it was a direct sales company, obviously, uh, but you're now in the presence of big thinkers, people who are making things happen. So kind of walk us through what began to change inside Cindy, because, you know, not everybody starts an in-home business and has your story. Well, I think one thing, like I never went to college, and so to me, I thought, oh my goodness, I have a chance. I'm going to give this four years. I'm going to invest my time, my talent, and my treasure. And then after four years, it'll be just like college. Then I can graduate and then I can make some money. I didn't, I didn't set myself up for disappointment. I've always had a, a mantra like I'm not, I'm undisappointable. I know that's not a word, but I'm unoffendable. I just decided no matter what, somebody else may have had to work, you know, a tenth of as much as me, that didn't matter. I knew at a proper time I would reap a harvest if I just didn't quit. And so my mentor um, just really was good for me because I didn't talk right, Linda. I was from the country. <laughs> I didn't dress right. I didn't do hardly anything right on if you were looking at it from the outside. But I love the scripture that, you know, God sees the inside, the world sees the outside. And she saw my inside. She knew there was a sleeping giant. I always say I was a, an eagle. I was just a very wounded eagle. And I needed somebody to say, you can do it. And that's what I was surrounded by. You know, you can do it. And I think of Lassie and Timmy, you can do it, Lassie. You can get out of the well. <laughs> you know, you can do it. And then also I was a good student. Okay, I know you were a home ec teacher and you appreciated. I was on the front row. I never missed an opportunity to learn. I was like Pac-Man for knowledge. I even completely memorized my entire presentation before I did one, completely memorized it because I was so afraid of appearing a fool. Just like in school, I studied and I wanted to make my coach proud. Some of those things from my childhood continue on in my professional life. She believed in me and I wanted to prove her right. So I was on the front row, copiously taking notes and, and being willing to figure it out forward. I don't really say fail forward because I don't think we really, I think we're not born winners or losers. We're all born learners and who you learn from determines whether you win or lose. So well, I was hungry. Clearly, clearly there was a oh, very strong team here. The first person who believed in you was your coach and you stayed. I mean, you stayed an extra year to not disappoint them, to prove that he was, you know, his interest in you were vested. And the same thing happened with your mentor in your in-home business. She believed in you and, and that's what you wanted. I mean, you just needed someone to see the goodness in you. And so later on to my friends and followers who are watching this, as we keep going into the subject further and further, we're going to talk about who do you allow in your head? Who do you allow mm -hmm. in your space? 
you know, back in the times that Cindy and I are talking right now, there wasn't technology. It just happened to be whoever lived on your street or whoever you drove to put yourself in front of. And now literally with the world at your fingertips, you can choose the Cindy's of the world to put them in your head at any given moment. You can choose to be in front of powerful people every day, feeding you affirmations and goodness and finding your gifts, or you can not. So there was a good theme there with that. So <clears throat> once once your confidence started developing, Cindy, and, and, and once that you saw that it's like, okay, I can do this, was there ever a time the old fears kept coming back? Like the, no, you just every left day. it. <laughs> no, no. Oh, every day. Oh, every day. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I would think of her as the little girl that would pop her ugly head up and say, who do you think you are? You know, and then this other little girl would pop her head up and said, you can do it. And I would just physically shove her down. I used to even play a game. Like I would scratch the top of my head, like in Star Trek, when the Klingons were coming at you, they would push the button and the force field would come down and all the bad things would bounce off. So if you came at me with your negativity or, you know, I can't believe you're not making homemade cookies for the bake off or whatever, then I would just scratch my head and say, wow, wow was my word. Wow. And I put the force field up physically. And then as you walked away, I would scratch my head and I would raise the force field. But I guarded my heart, my, my three platforms for success, for me to be successful in my life and business were number one, guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. Number one, guard your heart. Number two, gain wisdom, though it costs you all you have gain understanding. And number three, pass it on to teach the younger women to be reverent in the way they live and not to be addicted to too much, whatever, wine or TV or so, whatever you're addicted to, so that they can pass it on. Those were just something in the early, I even have it here in front of me, but in the early years, I wrote that out based on scripture because that was where my truth came from, but that's, that supported me in the journey. And then I had three sons. I was so grateful and happy. God blessed me with three amazing boys and the first one I had in my mid twenties, the second, almost 30 and the third one, almost 40, you know, same marriage. I just had a wonderful surprise at the end. And I really wanted to, they were a priority. I wanted to nurse my babies. I wanted to feed them healthy foods. And so I had, I have no strategy in my, when you do those tests, Linda's the strategist, that's the least of my gifting, but because I was so driven by the dream of having a peaceful home. Remember, I lived in chaos. I never stayed in the same house two years in a row. I didn't want my kids to ever move. We we bring some of our past to our future, right? So we st I stayed and lived in the same house for 30 years. My kids never moved. And I got to send them to the school right around the corner. It was public in the beginning, then private for my situation. They all went to college and that was vital to me. So I made a plan. So Monday night was my meeting for my home-based business. And I would go shopping at the grocery store on, on Monday nights because I'm all fired up anyway, I'd get all excited. And then I would buy all my groceries for the week. So this is a, a common sense strategy that helped me feed my family, raise my kids and still run a very, very, very successful home-based business. So I would buy all my food and we would have, Tuesday was fish for like 15 years. Wednesday was chicken and Thursday was beef with the exact same size because my kids didn't care. They were boys, they just wanted quantity, and on time, we ate every day at 5 dot exactly five o'clock, because that's what worked for our family. And so by, by 6.30, I was out of the kitchen, the, the homework was done, and I was free to either read books to my kids, do projects with them, or go work on my business, whatever I was free to do. But that was a plan. My meat was never frozen, because they stay fresh in that order. Fish, chicken, beef. <laughs> I, I soaked a pot of red beans every Friday night for years. And Friday, Saturday morning, I could put red beans on the crock pot or on the stove because we had sports. When you raised three boys, Matt ran track and played football. Um, Chance went on to play Division I college basketball. He was a great basketball player. Then my youngest son loved computers and more of a quiet kid. So he really wanted more special time with his mom. He was six foot five, but he wasn't the athlete. So I Saturdays were super busy for me. I rarely worked my home-based business on Saturdays because my kids were so active with their life. So I put on a pot of red beans and rice in the morning. So man, that'll feed you all weekend. And then I'd start over. So that I had some systems in place, Linda, that
that supported my goal of keeping my my faith was very important to me and then second really was my health and their health because if i wasn't around to take care of them there wouldn't be a family and then it was the wealth you know not just what you're making but what are you spending i've always been a good steward of my time my talent and my treasure and so some people have like a lot of stuff i like security because of the way i grew up i never wanted to have to depend on anybody i am where i am based on the choices i've made or allowed others to make for me my entire life and there's a compound effect of healthy choices and a compound effects of bad choices in all areas and i'm really proud to say I am, I'm the happiest, healthiest person that I know. I, I really am. I could not be happier. I'm, I'm healthy. I always say my affirmations. I'm healthy, wealthy, and wise. And I'm wealthy enough because of the choices I've made for the last 40 years to really set me up. And I agree like you. I believe the rest of my life is the best of my life. I know the, the best is yet to come. I wait in joyful anticipation every day for the sun to rise to see what adventure life is going to give me because I know that life is a gift. Well, I mean, you've totally wrapped up like everything that I've been talking about for the past two months and you've set us up completely for the next two months because everything you just said are key, key ingredients of being your own boss. And you have totally, you've totally done that. And you know, we talked in my very first episode that, you know, I woke up at age 37 and I started at affirming that the best 30 years of my life were ahead of me. And, you know, I could look at the age of my parents. I could look at what health issues were in my family. This is not a big mystery, you guys, but you also have to remember what Pam said last week, DNA is only a tiny percent of your health. It's only a tiny percent. So, you know, if you lost your parents at a young age and grandparents, that is not a death sentence for you. So you need to change the way we think and start affirming that the best 30 years of your life are ahead of you. And Cindy, you're getting better every single year. And I think, you know, you said a second ago, you said a compound effect of choices. I think that compound effect of all the good choices that you were making in your life brought Dean into your life. Amen. You, I don't know how much you want to tell the audience about Dean and how you all met. I don't know how much you want to do that. I just look at your life now and I think, OMG, for anybody out there who might be in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or even 80s, guys, there's still somebody wonderful out there because you proved it. Well, words have a life. Change your words and you'll change your world. When I was single, I, eight, eight years ago when I ha happily left, it was the happiest day of my life. Um, just so you know, <laughs> my kids were grown and I was never unhappy, by the way. Let me just clarify. I was in an unhealthy relationship. He didn't really think it was unhealthy, um, but um, and it, that doesn't matter. But I was always joy filled you guys and you would have never known that it was um, unhealthy but when i left i will tell you the truth the day i pulled away from my house i pulled over on the side of the road and i put my arms in the air because i do this all the time v for victor victim or victor we choose victory i wear victory i love victory and i put my arms in my head over my head i got out of my car put my arms in my head like a big giant funnel and i looked up at god and i said okay god i do not want to be alone I've been alone really my whole life. I want to be loved and I want to love so hard. And I have five imperatives and you have to pick him for me, God. I won't choose well, I know. So I won't choose him. But my five imperatives are number one, he has to love you. I don't care his religion, but he has to have a relationship with Jesus. That's vital to me. You can't think we came from an amoeba in the ocean, okay? Number one. Number two, he has to be smart. I cannot be married to a dumb man for the rest of my life. Number three, has to be ambitious bound out of bed like a gazelle, love self-actualization, growth, leadership, learning, growing. Number four, he has to be romantic. Kiss me 400 times a day. I'll get oxygen piped in so I can breathe. I want to <laughs> kiss the fun. And number five, the boy has to dance because this girl, Cindy Williams, loves to dance. I mean, loves to dance every day. I dance all the time and he has to dance. And I got back in my car and I drove off into the sunset and I really did give it to God. And all, so many of my friends would say, oh, Cindy, you're going to have to kiss a lot of frogs to find your prince. And I was like, I never say that. I know that I'm going to get the perfect guy for me. Women say, and men too say, like, I just look at food and gain weight. Guys, quit saying stuff like that, okay? <laughs> I knew I would find him and he would find me. 
and two years later, I love to dance, and I don't know how much time we have, but I, I have the best romantic story, Linda Tupin, if you want me to well, tell it. Hey, this is my podcast. I'm in charge. It can be as long as we want it to be, and this story okay. is so good, and it's such a fitting ending to what we're talking about. Well, you know, when you don't know what healthy looks like, I'm just going to tell you, you know, then um, you probably wouldn't choose well. And um, so I, it was on, I can tell you exactly, December the 5th, I had left. I went, I got a penthouse on the beach. I said, I told my boys, your dad's going to have a ranch and your mom is going to be on a beach someplace. So don't worry. The grandkids will get to come and have fun no matter what. And so I, I moved to the far, far east, right? And then gradually I came back to um, to Texas because honestly, there wasn't anybody I ever met. And God, those of you that are single, you know, maybe they'd be game on and um, they'd look really good. And then they'd start talking. I'd say, oh, you should have been silent. <laughs> I just could never, I just never met you. I was open. I was looking, but oh Lord, I never met anybody. So then it was the, I was going back to to Texas where my kids were to see him for Christmas. It was December the 15th. I drove back into town, saw my kids on a uh, Wednesday, Thursday night. It was a Friday night, December 18th. I know the day it was a Friday night, December 18th. This December was six years ago. And I'm sitting at home by myself. My kids were too busy to visit me. They're grown, grown men. And so I thought I'm not sitting here all night by myself. So I called Virginia. I said, Virginia, let's go dancing. Well, Virginia is 80 something years old. She was in the same business as me and my um, home-based business. And she was so much fun. Red hair, fit as the fiddle, so much fun. And her husband, Charlie, was the best dancer in all of Texas, but Charlie has all timers. He doesn't know who you are, or who I am, but he was the best dancer. So I said, let's go take Charlie dancing. So we go in the doors to this little bar in Kerrville, Texas called the End of the Hill, little hotel, this, this big, but they have a country western band. I put on my ML Letty custom cowboy boots, my tight blue jeans, my friend shirt, off I go. <laughs> I walk in the door at nine o'clock to meet Virginia and Charlie. And we walked to the back, sat together, and I danced with Charlie all night long. It was so much fun. And then 11, about in the middle of the, the night, Virginia said, there's this cute guy at the bar with a black cowboy hat. He keeps looking at you. You should go talk to him. And I said, he should come talk to me. I was not going to talk to anybody. So 11 o'clock at night, Virginia says, you know, I need to get Charlie to bed. I said, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to go home too. I've had my dance. And so me, Virginia, and Charlie start heading towards the door. Well, the guy in the black cowboy hat runs up to me and says, excuse me, but I'd love to ask you to dance. And I looked at him. The first thing I ever said to him was, well, what took you so long? <laughs> because I'm thinking, I've been dancing, God bless Charlie, but with ugly cowboys all night long and you've been sitting there. And he just looked at me and he said, well, would you dance with me? I said, sure. I'll kiss Virginia goodnight. Get on the dance floor. And oh my gosh, he can't dance a lick, okay, a lick. But I'm polite, I don't say anything. So we sit down and we start talking. He tells me he's been single 20 years. And he said, well, God loves me a lot. And I looked at him, I was like, we're in a bar. That's not exactly a come on line. I said, well, I said, well God loves me more. You know, miss, I have to win. Anyway, it was an interesting conversation from the very first time I met Dean. And then we danced a second time. And I just, in the middle of the dance, I stopped. I pushed him back and I said, look, this is not working. I only get to go dancing like once a year. It's really important to me and you just can't dance. I don't know what you're gonna do next, so I can't follow you. I said, but it could work. I was trying to be very polite. I said, it could work. I said, you just have to let me lead. <laughs> it didn't work. Okay, so we go back to the bar and I said, you know what? Thank you for the dancing. It's been really nice to meet you, but I'm gonna go home now. And he said, well, I really love to get your phone number. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm traveling, I'm busy. I'm not gonna have time to, to date. And I'm thinking you can't dance anyway. But I, I said, I don't even live here. And um, he said, well, I live in Seabrook, Texas. And I was like, are you kidding me? My best friends, Linda, in the whole world live in Seabrook, Texas, and it's about this big. And I thought, well, maybe God meant for me to meet him. I don't know. So I gave him my phone number. Well, that was off I go. That's December 18th. Well, he starts calling me and texting me and I'm polite because I'm a nice person, but I just didn't give him any energy. Be like, hello, this is Sears, may I help you? <laughs> he just kept being nice. Then one night he texted me the word, he's texted me the word wanderer. And I was like, and I texted him like, what does that mean? He said, well, can I call you? I said, sure. So he calls me and he's sitting at the beach because Seabrook is close to Galveston, Texas. And he had a brand new convertible Corvette. I found out later, whatever. That night he was in a pickup truck, but anyway, 
he, he was sitting at the water listening to music and he said he heard the old song, I'm the kind of guy that likes to roam around and go from town to town, the wanderer. And it reminded him of me because every time he would call me, I'd be getting on a plane for Switzerland or I'd be heading up the East Coast because I was, I was working and traveling a lot. And he said, it made me think of you. And in the background, the next song came on and it was Elton John's Rocket Man. And I said, oh, I love Elton John. I love that song, Rocket Man. He said, well, I am the Rocket Man. I drive speed boats, I drive race cars. And I went, hmm. And I was like, that's interesting. It's, that's kind of attractive, right? And so he would text me, this, it was the beginning of the cat and mouse. He would text me Wanderer and I would text him back Rocket Man. So it was December 18th, I met him. Then we have January, February, we're sort of talking, texting, but no romance. Then March, I'm speaking at a conference in a town not far from where he lives. He said, oh, let me take you to dinner. I said, okay. So he, he walks in the door of this um, restaurant uh, um, and um, I barely hardly recognized him because he just looked so different. He looked really good. He has the prettiest blue eyes, this big old smile. And um, we had dinner that night. It was very nice. And after dinner, there was a piano bar there. And he said, would you like to dance? And I said, well, you know, I like to dance. And I'm thinking, oh, buddy, you should have kept with conversation. It's going to go south from here. And we got on the dance floor and he put his arm in the middle of my back and he was going with the music. And I was like, do I not remember the boy couldn't dance? Have I had too much wine? We drank a bottle of wine. So we sat back down. We talked a little bit more. And the conversation, he was so smart, so witty, so ambitious, so kind. I just raised his son and he'd been single 20 years. He was just, I just, he was a very, I mean, he would have been my best friend if I hadn't fallen in love with him. So we got on the dance floor the second time and it was just like it happened in December. I stopped in the middle of the dance. I pushed him back and I said, okay, what's going on? You are not the same guy I danced with in December. And he smiled and glittered like a Christmas tree. And he said, I wanted to surprise you, Cindy. I says, okay, what do you mean? He said, I've been taking dancing lessons for three months. I was like the little boy on Home Alone. Cause my, <laughs> Dean Piper had a Every boat motor woman business. Woman he is the- Crying. <laughs> Every woman listening is, to this is crying. <laughs> who, I mean, he's not the kind of guy that would take dancing lessons. And I said, you've been taking dancing lessons? And this is how wise he is. He said, I didn't do it for you, Cindy. He said, I did it for me. He said, I got in my truck that night after I met you. And I said to myself, this will never happen to me again. <laughs> He said, Dean Piper, you better get your game on. He said, I didn't think I'd ever see you again, but he said, I knew I had to straighten up my act. And then come to find out his dad had died. His brother had died. He had given up on dating. He'd had some bad situations and he just was said, I was just being lazy. It wasn't who I really was. And you woke me up to make me realize I had a lot more to offer. So that was in the middle of March. We went to dinner. And so it was, Chemistry was starting, okay? That was on a Wednesday night. I remember the nights. And then I didn't see him again because I was very busy with my conference I was speaking at. So he said, well, can I come back and take you to dinner on Saturday night? Same restaurant, same time. I said, sure. So he comes back and we danced, same piano bar. We danced every song. We danced all night long. Conversation got richer and deeper and he kissed me. And I'm just going to tell you, you know, number three, or four on my list is romance. He was the best kisser I ever kissed in my whole life. I like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. So that was on a Saturday night. So then I said, well, thank you for two dinners. He spent this money. Thank you for the kiss. Thank you for all the dancing, but I'm leaving early in the morning. I'm heading to Mississippi. And so I don't know when I'm gonna see you again. And he said, well, I really care about you, Cindy. And I was like, well, you don't even know me, dude. I was like, we've you know, been out twice. He said, oh, I know you. He said, I've known you since I saw you walking across the parking lot at the end of the hills. I could feel your energy all the way across the parking lot. And I said, what do you mean saw me walking? Linda, he was leaving at nine. He, he's not a player. He had, he, he had gone and worked on his ranch, stopped, had a steak dinner, stopped to have a beer and was going back to his ranch. He was leaving and he saw me. I parked way, across, way away from that door of the bar <laughs> and walked all the way around and I want my car anywhere near a bar back in then with my anyway and so he saw me walking across and he came back in he said I ran up to the door and opened it for you 
trying to catch your eye, but you went by me like you were going to a fire because I walked fast, talked fast, and I ran in and met Virginia. Then I sat in the back of the bar with Virginia and Charlie. So he sat at the bar for two hours watching me dance, but he didn't know how to dance. So that's why he didn't talk to me. Ah! Oh and I said, oh my God, you saw me walking across the parking lot and you came back in? He said, yes. And, um, and I said, so what am I supposed to do with this information, Mr. Piver? You really care about me? Do you want me to wear your class ring? Do you want to go steady? And then you're only going to date me and I'm only going to date you. I said, you're a sexy single guy with a brand new convertible Corvette. I'm going to be gone for two months. Do you want to be going steady with the girl you're not going to see again for two months? He said, that's exactly what I want to do. And I was like, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. I said, you, I said, are you kidding me? And I said, okay, I'll play. I don't date. I'm not giving anything up. So I'll go steady with you, big boy. Let's just see how that works out. And then off I go to Mississippi. So he calls me on the way to Mississippi. He said, can I come see you this weekend? I said, no, you're very distracting. I have a lot to do. <laughs> he said, what about this weekend? I said, well, my sister's grandson is having his seventh birthday party at the Biloxi Bowling Alley at 2 p.m. on Saturday if you want to show up thinking, mm-hmm, guess who shows up at two o'clock in the afternoon in Biloxi, Mississippi, in the convertible with the top down, gave in all the boys rides, playing games with them, going bowling with them. I was like, oh, you, he's bringing his A game. And then after the bowling, he said, let's go right up and down the coast. We put the top down, we played and sang at the top of our lungs, every oldie goldie song. It was like a movie, white sand, waves crashing. We whip into a seaside cafe. I never ate a raw oyster in my life, but I had one that day. I was like, okay, life begins. And I <laughs> fell in love with him. I fell in love with him in March. And we dated for four, four or five years. And we got married September 26, 2020. This is 20. We've been married yeah. one year, that's September. Yes. And I am. He is my soulmate. He's my best friend. He's the most ambitious, kind, common sense. Oh my gosh, fun. We, 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 we have so much fun. I feel like I'm 16. We, we act like, we live like we're 16. And it's the best. I, I'm truly the happy. I think we have the healthiest marriage in the whole world. When I say healthy, that's a word I really want to, you know, it's a healthy marriage. He's not perfect. He's just perfect for me. And I'm not perfect but I'm perfect for him. And for the first time in my life, I understand two became one. We do everything. I trust him with my life and vice versa. So I can't wait. I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And I appreciate you doing, this makes me cry, giving me a platform to share my story because it's a story of hope. No matter what your background, no matter what your education, you know, by God's grace, and our grit, um, making healthy common sense choices, surrounding yourself with mentors and friends like Linda Tupin, and you can and will become all that God created you to be. Well, Cindy Williams, you have taken everyone's breath away today. You have filled their joy jar to the very, very top. You've given people hope in every word, every fiber, all your energy wasn't just across the parking lot in Kerrville, Texas. The energy came across the, the waves here today, across the internet, where millions of people can catch it. And you have an incredible story to tell and you have incredible gifts to share with literally millions of men and women. And so we never end an episode here on Common Sense Choices. And today is very, very, like very appropriate for me to do a shout out to my soulmate who doesn't know yet that I exist, but I am absolutely one determined woman. And so Mike Rowe, did you hear that? Please take notes, Mike Rowe, on how this will all play out for us in the future. <laughs> all right, you guys wrap up this music. This episode is over. Oh, homework, homework, homework. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Homework is gratitude. That's what you've heard. Because we got to start somewhere, okay? The fairy tale ending is not is not tomorrow. It's going to have to start with gratitude, assessing your gifts. What has God gifted you? Let's use it. Let's ignore what you don't have, and then let's start a gratitude journal of things that you're grateful for. Thank you, my friend Cindy Williams. You guys, we'll see you next week on Common Sense Choices.